Acts 1, 2, 3. There we go. All right. All right. Good evening, everybody. And uh, nice job navigating the raindrops coming in here today. Um, so we, last week, completed what we call the Emmanuel songs, uh, the three songs that deal with the birth of Jesus. Um, and there's seven total songs, uh, or poems, as they're called. And before we get into the last four, which are known as the servant songs, because they deal with the actual ministry of Jesus, uh, we're going to, well, th those servant songs start in chapter 42. But we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 40 tonight, <coughs> because just like before Jesus comes in his in, to do ministry before he gets baptized, um, we get John the Baptist, right? We were introduced to John the Baptist before the ministry of Jesus. <coughs> and what you see is that John the Baptist, as you know, uh, had the Holy Spirit from the womb, right? From the very womb, he had the Holy Spirit. And so John kind of represents the Spirit, and he introduces us to Jesus who John calls the Word, right? The, the Logos, the Word. So you have the Spirit coming before the Word. Just like in creation, you had the Spirit hovering over the waters, and then the Word was spoken, and God created that way. In your salvation, it says the Spirit moves in you, and then faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So you always have this combination of the Spirit followed by the Word. Well, it's no different even in prophecy, so even in, in, in telling the story of Jesus in the future, some eight centuries later, uh, before we get to chapter 42, where we're going to get the introduction of the ministry of Christ, we're now going to be in a chapter that introduces us to John the Baptist. John the Baptist had prophecy about him in Isaiah chapter 40 here. So you see even in prophetic terms, you have the spirit coming before the word again. So... Um, we're going to see uh, John the Baptist, I believe, is the only prophet that has prophecy about him. So that's kind of neat to see uh, the uniqueness of John the Baptist in that way. And before we pray, I just want to say that, you know, um, I don't think there's anything like um, inspired about this, but <coughs> I think there's something kind of neat about the fact that the Bible has how many books? 66. Isaiah has how many chapters? And the Bible has 39 Old Testament books. Isaiah's first 39 chapters are largely dealing with judgment on, on the nations. And then the New Testament is, uh, Matthew starts the New Testament. It's the 40th book of the Bible. We're now in the 40th chapter of the Bible. And Matthew introduces us to this new era of grace. And we're going to see a new, uh, a new tone in Isaiah towards grace as well. So Isaiah is sometimes referred to as a mini Bible uh, for that reason. Now it can't be inspired, these coincidences, because the chapters and verses came many hundreds of years after, the, or in Isaiah's case, a thousand or so years after the writing of it. But we do see that kind of neat dynamic happening. And because of the change of that tone... I want to quote Martin Luther here for a second, because I think it's a great thought entering into this chapter uh, of grace, is, he said, the apostles are entrusted with a new kind of teaching, which is the gospel, for until now, nothing was taught but the law, and that was terrifying and killing, said Luther, the terrifying and killing law was taught in the Old Testament. He says, but the apostles get entrusted with a new kind of teaching, this new grace, um, new age of, of grace. And you're going to see that in chapter 40. You're going to see the tone change towards, towards that grace. It's more of a New Testament feel to it. And the duress that <coughs> this has been building up in Isaiah up before chapter 40 is talking about Babylonian captivity. That, and you'll see that in Jeremiah, that they actually go into Babylonian captivity. And 
the answer to their duress that leading up to chapter 40 is going to be the sacrifice that's going to be predicted in chapter 52. Okay, so we can just see this building up of complications and trials, and then we're now we're going to start sensing some of that relief coming, and that relief is going to be realized through this tremendous uh, prophecy of chapter 52 and 53, where... Uh, I think skeptics have a really hard time with trying to explain away the exact details that these scriptures are giving of Jesus um, uh, being spat upon, um, being um, uh, whipped and, and killed. And it's just, uh, it's like Isaiah was there. It's like he's giving an eyewitness account of the crucifixion of Jesus. All right, so uh, let's uh, pray. And then we'll dig into chapter 40. So, Father, we dedicate this time to you. Lord, lift you up um, that you would just have your way uh, as, as our word is open and our hearts are tuned into you. Lord, we're not out there in the streets and the traffic anymore. We're not in the busyness of our homes or works anymore. Lord, we're in your house. Our Bibles are open. Our attention is yours. And we pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so chapter 40, verse 1, after all these kind of warnings of captivity, that it's going to be uh, punishment for their sins, it's kind of a Hebrews 12, God disciplines those that he loves and considers his children. It's kind of a, um, God had said earlier in the Old Testament that he would raise up nations to discipline Israel, and this, these are... Uh, oracles about God raising up other nations to discipline Israel and so forth. And then if you were reading from Isaiah 1 to Isaiah 66, if you're going to sit down and read these 66 book chapters, you would be uh, reading through these 39 chapters and it'd be pretty heavy. It'd be pretty heavy stuff to read through. And then when you flip the page and you're like, okay, chapter 40, what's the first word you're greeted with? comfort. And at that point, you'd be saying, where did this word come from? I mean, how in the world is there a word of comfort in the midst of everything that we've been reading? And how, in the midst of all the guilt that's been pointed out, how is God going to be just and grant that comfort? Well, that's going to be 12 chapters from now when he introduces the suffering of that servant, his son, the servant. But for now, in this chapter, we're going to hear from three voices. Three voices are going to speak to us. Two of them you're probably going to recognize from the New Testament because they're fulfilled in the New Testament and different New, uh, New Testament authors quote these scriptures to us. And, um, and now we're going to see kind of the deeper meanings of these scriptures. So chapter 40, verse 1 says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, I know in the English translations it sounds like she's being punished double for what her sins are worth, but it's actually quite the opposite meaning. It's kind of like the two-edged sword of the Bible that both convicts and it blesses, right? Well, <coughs> this double for all her sins has the picture of that hey, your sins deserve this, and it would be great, and you'd probably be thrilled if you just heard it was canceled out, right? Your debt is canceled. But it's not just canceled out. You're actually going to get blessed and receive blessings on top of it, okay? So the wages of sin is death, and so because we're sinners, we're, we've earned and deserved hell, and it would be great if God just said, you're not going to hell. You're just going to you know, stay here on the earth, you know, that, that would be tremendous reason to worship him, right? But then he throws in heaven. And it's like, where did that come from? Okay, we're not people who warrant heaven. So, uh, so we're, that's the double, you know, you're not getting what you should get, and you're actually going to get something far greater that you, you haven't deserved. So she's received double for all her sins. Now, it's more mercy then that meets the eye is what I put in your notes there. If you have a barcode on the back of your chair and you scan that, I think it'll pull up the notes there for you. 
Uh, I don't know if every chair has them, but probably within arm's length uh, you could get that. And I left a lot of blanks in the notes because this is kind of like just me leading you and you, you filling in, okay? And I know you're like, hey, you usually do all the work for us, and I know, but not this week. We're going to see who's real deal in this room here. All right. So now we get to our first voice. It says it's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. How many of you have NIVs on you right now looking at NIV? Just one. Okay. I actually think yours is probably punctuated correctly here. I think the others are not, uh, personally. Uh, like mine, NKJV says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and then it starts the quotes, correct? Is that how your, most of your Bibles read? In the NIV, it says, the voice of one crying, and then the quote starts, right? Okay, I actually think that's right. I think it's the voice crying, and part of the cry is talking about in the wilderness here to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay? Because I think there's something too. Um, it's in the wilderness that we got to do this preparation. So what it says is, the voice of one crying, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." All right, so what do we have here? Well, it says this voice is... Now, somebody in the New Testament said, I'm that voice. Who was that? John the Baptist said, I'm that voice that's crying. And so this says you have to prepare the way for the Lord. And then it gives a description of lifting up valleys, lowering mountains smoothing out rough places, making crooked places straight. And so that's what they would do when a king was coming. And a king going from point A to point B, they're not going to have him go up, down, around, and, and have bumps in his ride. They're going to bring him from A to B as straight as an arrow as they can, as smooth as smoothest way as possible. So you had to prepare the way for these kings to come to you. So this first voice is saying, you have a king coming to you. You have to prepare his way. Now, what's interesting is John the Baptist says, I'm that voice. He's the one that's calling for us to prepare the way. So what king is he announcing is coming? Jesus. So, but what was John's ministry? How did he tell us to prepare? He says, I come with the ministry of what? Repentance. Repentance is how you prepare the way for King Jesus to come to you. Okay, we repent and then we're baptized, correct? Repent, 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 okay? Um, you should be hearing that word repent from your pulpit at some time, okay? You, we need that word repent uh, given to us all the time. A lot of times we do evangelism and everything's just about receiving. Isn't that how you spoil people? Just receive the Lord, just receive, receive. No, repent and then receive. Okay, prepare the way of the Lord. It's your repentance. Okay, there should be a brokenness over our rebellion, over our sin, over the fact that our, by our very nature, our very nature that we, we can't escape is opposed to God. And that nature has got to be reborn. It's got to be reformed. We can't be conformed. We've got to be transformed, correct? That transformation is such a change that Paul will say, you're a brand new creation. You're a whole new person now. He'll literally say who you were before Jesus has got to die. Can he use any stronger language than that? He's got to die. That old man has got to, to be put to death. Okay? And then new ways come. Okay, the new ways come. Uh, one of the, you know, I don't have one of those dramatic salvation moments. You know, I'm not like the Apostle Paul where I'm blinded and, and you know, God's like, why are you kicking against the goads? And, you know, and I'm like, who are you, Lord? That didn't happen to me. Right? It happens to some of you. You had these very dramatic salvation experiences. You're like Paul. Mine was more like Timothy. You know, just kind of brought up in the faith. And you had people guiding you in the faith. And, and it's just kind of smooth sailing for the most part all through that, uh, that time period. And I can't put a, a date or an hour on my salvation. Okay, my testimony is sometimes God has people seem, seemingly from the womb. He just... You just kind of grow up in the knowledge of them, and that knowledge 
uh, becomes uh, in your heart and you live it out and, and you know you embrace it. And that's what I see in Timothy. But, um, but either way, both in both cases, the Paul case and the Timothy case, both were sinners in need of salvation. Okay, both were. And so uh, there has to come a moment where we have regret over being uh, of a nature that rebels against God. Okay? So um, experience, they lost their innocence. Now they've acquired shame and they want coverage. They've experienced they lost their innocence. Now they've acquired shame and they want coverage. And I think that's the time to start speaking the gospel to them. Okay, now you start telling them about Jesus. Okay? If they turn 12, 13 and they still like run around naked, you need to have a talk <laughs> with them. All right? Okay. All right. Okay. Now, yeah, John the Baptist said this was fulfilled in him. If you join me in Luke chapter 3, first six verses I want to share with you real quick. It says, uh, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor over Judea, Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. You with me? Okay, because I didn't follow that, so okay. All right. The word of God came to John. Couldn't they just start with that, you know? Hey, the word of God came to John, okay? <laughs> the word of God came to John, son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. There's the great need of humankind. Through Jesus Christ, we're offered that. As it is written in the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. The rough way smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Isn't it neat when you read the New Testament and you see they're saying this is not a brand new religion. This is the fulfillment of a former religion. Okay, there's no other religion that claims that, is it? That we're fulfilling something that's already been going on. It's a much more difficult task is to create a religion that's fulfilling something that already existed because it's everything's got to match perfectly, right? It's a difficult task to create that fictionally, okay? But if it actually does fulfill something, it, it, it's, it's showing the reality of it. All right. So John's way of preparing the way of the Lord is through repentance. It's how you make. That's why I think the quote begins with, in the wilderness, make straight paths for the Lord. Because that wilderness is your heart. That's where you've got to straighten these paths out. It's where you've got to repent. In the wilderness of your heart. What's the first two syllables of wilderness? Some of you are going to say wilder. I mean wild. It's wilderness, right? It's the wild. Okay, you've got to tame that wild uh, through repentance. All right. So the first voice is basically saying to us, you have a king coming to you, so prepare his way. And then John the Baptist says that way is through repentance. Everybody good on the first voice? All right, let's move to verse 6 with the second voice that we get. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and it's, all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, do you know that last line there, the word of our God stands forever? That was the dominant verse of the Re Reformation. It's what they based all of the Reformation on, is that the word of God stands forever. That's why we don't go, we don't go by human tradition. Okay, we don't go by anything that's not written in this book. Uh, to me, that is so pure. Such a pure way of directing God's people. is it's, it's sola scriptura, right? Scripture only. All right. Now, where do we hear of this in the New Testament? I believe it's in 1 Peter. Isn't it 1 Peter chapter 1? Okay. <laughs> in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 22... It says, since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth 
through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is grass, and the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So, now, it's a little sad to hear about the withering grass and the fading flower, and then to be told that that's people, right? We're the witherers, we're the faders. But they said there's something that stands forever. And What is that? The word. Now, if I brought you to John chapter 1, it's going to say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him, the word, was life. And that life was the light of men, correct? And then if you go down to verse 14, it'll tell you that word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. I think that's the biggest crisis to ever hit our planet. Was that creator that's out there making all this stuff put skin on and looked us in the eye and told us, nobody comes to the Father but through me, right? So now it demands a verdict from everybody, okay? Okay. He demands a verdict from everybody. What's your decision? Who do you say that I am? I think it's the key question in the New Testament. All right? Now, hey, as this verse tell, says to you, you're to cry out to the world. Hey, as this verse tell, says to you, you're to cry out to the world. Hey, behold. As this verse tell, says to you, you're to cry out to the world. Hey, behold. Verse tell, says to you, you're to cry out to the world. Hey, Behold, your God says to you, you're to cry out to the world, hey, behold your God. It's to you, you're to cry out to the world, hey, behold your God. You're to cry out to the world, hey, behold your God. And what cry out to the world, hey, behold your God. And what question out to the world, hey, behold your God. And what question would you answer the world, hey, Behold your God. And what question would you anticipate them? Hey, behold your God. And what question would you anticipate them saying? Hey, behold your God. And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shout? Behold your God. And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out? To behold your God. And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community? Behold your God. And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community, your God? And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community, hey, be God? And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community, hey, behold your And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community, hey, behold your God? And what question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community, hey, behold your God? What question would you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community, Hey, behold your God. Do you anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community? Hey, behold your God. Anticipate them saying if you shouted out to your community? Hey, behold your God. Behold what? Okay, what do you want me to behold? First of all, what is beholding? Okay, beholding is your ability to use your mind's eye your biblical imagination, because the truths you're about to be presented are not common in human experience. If they don't exist at all in human experience. Okay, so how, are, how is God going to talk to us if we don't behold? A good example of somebody not beholding is when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And he says, I tell you the truth, you must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't behold that fact. Instead, he says, mom ain't going to like me crawling up into her womb again. Right? So Jesus has to say, you're the teacher of Israel, and I tell you heavenly things and you don't understand. How are you going to teach people if you don't understand heavenly truths? You have to behold. Okay, you have to behold. So you're going to get a great exercise tonight in beholding. Because this third voice says that you who prepare the way for this king, and this king comes to you and makes you eternal, you weren't saved just for you to be saved. 
you are saved because you've got a role to play in the kingdom that's at hand. The kingdom of God's at hand. It's right here. Okay, you have, you have a stature in that kingdom. You have a role to play in that kingdom. You're a participant in a kingdom. Okay, so you're to lift up your voices and pronounce, behold your God. Now, instructions on beholding, starting in verse 10. He starts with, behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. So consistent with the original verses of this chapter, which says you have a king coming to you, now you get a description of this king who's got a strong and mighty arm that will rule for him, and his reward is with him. So it's, it's about his strength. He's coming with a strong hand, and with his strength, he's going to rescue and he's going to reward. He's the king coming, a warrior king. To rescue and to reward. Remember the song of Moses when they crossed through the Red Sea? He said, the, 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 the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Can you hear the, like the pride welling up in Moses singing that? Okay. He's being chased down by the strongest army in the world. And he looks behind him and the very waters that open for his people to cross, he sees closing in on the Egyptians. And he sings, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. What just happened to this mighty army, I could never pull off. The Lord just fought that battle for me, right? The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. He has a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. His reward is with him, and his work before him. He's a mighty warrior who's come to rescue and to reward so that's the first thing to behold is his might. And then amazingly, it follows that with this. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. All of a sudden, it's not so intimidating, is it? Now he's a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. So one arm, he's ruling and fighting. And the other arm, he's carrying his lambs. And carry them in his bosom close and tenderly to him, and gently lead those who are with young. So not only does he come to fight, rescue, and reward, but he comes to provide and protect like a shepherd. Do you see now why he chose David from the shepherd fields and he became their great warrior king? What a reflection of God David was, huh? The shepherd boy who became a warrior king. Okay. Beautiful picture of that in verses 10 and 11. So we're to behold that. We're to behold that. Verse 12. Now, isn't it true that we're not to make an image of God? Okay. So what does that mean, we're not to make an image of God? Isn't that the second commandment? Shall not make for yourself a graven image? Okay. So if you bought a million dollar painting from the greatest artist and it was a painting of God the Father what could you know right now would be wrong with it what I can guarantee you is wrong with that painting is a completely underestimated God so when you look at that painting and you get in your mind that that's God you just look you just made that into a false God that is not God in that painting Okay, that's not God in the painting. If they could paint like a painting of light that completely killed you the moment you looked at it, now you might have a painting of God. Okay, if, his, if the glory of the painting was too much for you to survive, then maybe it's a good painting. All right, but otherwise you're putting images in people's minds of God that are so far short of the reality. And you're probably going to hinder their worship through that image you just put in their mind. Okay. So God's protecting your hearts by saying, do not make any graven image of me. You're going to minimize me. Okay, so we have to behold here. So listen to what it says in verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Where's the hollow of your hand? It's this little tiny circle right here, right? He's saying, can you, can you do a painting where the, the palm of that hand can hold about 330 million cubic miles of water? 
Otherwise, don't paint me. Okay? So who, who can do that? About approximately 330 million cubic miles of water in the hollow of his hand. Who measured heaven with a span? What's a span? Pinky to thumb. Okay, pinky to thumb. Now, what's the most visible constellation we have in our night sky here in the Western Hemisphere? You can see the Big Dipper, Little Dipper, but what, what stares us in the face all the time? It's Orion, the hunter, yeah, right? It's certainly his torso and, and most certainly his belt, right? Those three stars that go across the sky, we can easily recognize Orion's belt. And if you look at those stars of his belt, which are closer together than the rest of his torso, how far apart are those stars? They got to measure it in light years, right? They can't measure it in miles because that number is way too big. So I don't know how many light years it is, but some of these stars are thousands or millions of light years apart in our night sky. Uh, light traveling at 186,000 miles every single second. It takes the, that, th at that speed millions of years to go star to star. Okay, And that's just in the section of sky we're looking in. Now imagine you turn around and you start talking about stars behind you, how far that is from those stars. And then you realize in China, they're looking at a whole nother set of stars that are way, way, way far away from the stars we're looking at. And this is just a tiny section of the Milky Way, which is a tiny galaxy. Okay? So God's saying this. Do you know anybody that can make that in, the sp in a span? This is how God measured our universe. You see why you have to behold? Okay? Can you paint that? Who calculated the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? You've tried that, haven't you? God, why didn't you? God, why did you? God, you should have. Right? Okay. Do you know what omniscient means? Yeah. He knew exactly what he was doing. Every step of the way, he still does, even when he allows unpleasant things to come into our lives, right? Even when he allows evil to enter into our lives, okay? He's, he, he, he says this, with whom did he take counsel or who instructed him? Who waters in the palm of his hand in the dust of the earth on a scale? Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. You can burn all the animals of Lebanon, and it's still not a worthy sacrifice. Yet he accepts those sacrifices, doesn't he? Okay. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him as less than nothing and worthless. So all the burnt offerings of Lebanon are not sufficient to be a burnt offering to him. And we are 12 chapters away from seeing what a sufficient sacrifice looks like. And what's that going to be? It's going to be his son. It's the only thing that's sufficient. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? John Calvin said, the human mind is an idol factory. It's always creating idols, things that it adores in the place of God. Okay. Um, you ever have a rabbit's foot? Okay. Maybe a lucky penny. Okay. These things that you're like, thank goodness I have this because I'm going to be okay now. Right. Okay. Well, that's talking about you here. Okay, now here's the uh, human mind, the idol factory at work. It says the workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. In other words, we put our most precious metals into the stuff, right? Our most valued tre treasured possessions, gold and silver, to make these idols. Whoever's too poor for such a contribution 
chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. What are they making? <coughs> They're making an idol to worship, right? They're making their God. Remember when Aaron held up the golden calves and said, Israel, this is your God, right? Okay, they're making themselves gods to worship. And what, what, they have to build them a certain way because they're afraid what might happen to them. This cracks me up. They have to make them a certain way because they're afraid their God might totter. Have you come across a verse where God tottered? Okay. So they got to build them a certain skillful way because the God that they're about to worship might totter. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, God will mock the idol makers by saying, don't you realize you chop down a tree and you make an idol out of that wood and then with the rest of the wood, you cook <laughs> your dinner with it? It's the same tree. You're worshiping this part of it and you're cooking with that part of it. So what are you thinking? All right. Do you remember when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and they put it into their temple of Dagon and they went in to worship Dagon and what happened to him? He tottered. <laughs> he tottered. And then it said his, ha his head broke off and his hands broke off. Why do you think God had that happen? He has no wisdom, he has no power, and that's your God, okay? He tottered. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Can you put that into more modern words? With God saying this, I'm about to tell you something, I want to know this. Have you not known this? Have you not heard this? Haven't you been told this from the beginning? I, I can sum that up in a three-word question. Let's make it five. Five word question. Ready? God's saying this. Did you read your Bible? <laughs> okay. I've told you this from the beginning. How's your Bible start? In the beginning. Saying what I'm about to tell you, I've told you already, yet you don't seem like you've heard it before. Okay. So, you know, Paul Brown, the guy that uh, they named the Cleveland Browns after, started the NFL franchise. He liked to tell his players he hated celebrations in the end zone. And he liked to tell them, act like you've been there before. All right? Act like you've been there before. I love that. Okay, God's saying here, act like you've read this before. Okay? Your life should look like you've read this stuff before. And if you're idolizing anything, if you have any idols in your heart and your mind, have you not known? Haven't you heard? Hasn't it been told to you from the beginning? What? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. When, when, when was Isaiah alive? When was, he, when, was, when was his ministry? In the 8th century B.C., eight centuries before Christ. Okay? Now, if you're a flat earther in the room, you're going to get really offended right now. Okay? When did we finally give up on flat earth? Was it Columbus, Galileo? Okay, we're talking like the 15th, 16th century, right? A.D.? So what's the difference between the 16th century A.D. and the 8th century B.C.? How many centuries is that? 24 centuries. 24 centuries before we said the world was round, Isaiah said, have you not heard? Haven't I told you this already? God sits above the circle of the earth. Okay, and we went flat earth for 24 centuries. And listen, some people, maybe even watching or sitting in here, are still saying that it's flat earth. And, and I'm telling you right now, we have pictures. <laughs> okay, we've seen it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I had a student who was a flat earther. And, and I said, do you think the astronauts are lying? I mean, do you think they're going, oh, my gosh, really is flat, but don't tell anybody? <laughs> okay? It, it's just such an insane thing. <laughs> All right, anyways. 
It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. I don't know. How many of you have curtains? You do? We do? <laughs> oh, yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> I have curtains. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm thinking of the other blind things. All right, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> well, hi. <laughs> the blinds made me blind, yes. All right, so uh, how do you stretch out a curtain? It's on a point of singularity, and you stretch it out from that point of singularity, right? Okay, now listen. That's Albert Einstein and others that discovered this in the beginning of the 20th century that they discovered that the universe is expanding from a point of singularity. It couldn't be described any more po po poetically than being stretched out like a curtain. Okay? So that's 28 centuries before levels increased to 115 per the clot. That increases, those levels increased to 115% of what that increases, those levels increased to 115% of what they're going to be that increases, those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life. That increases, those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life. That increases, those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life on the eighth. That increases, those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life on the eighth day. Increases, those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life on the eighth day. And then they does, those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life on the eighth day. And then they decline. Those levels increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life on the eighth day. And then they decline increase to 115% of what they're going to be for the rest of your life on the eighth day, and then they decline. Man, what a good guesser Abraham was. Okay. All right, on the eighth day. I just recently read that one of the ways they helped stop the Black Plague was they realized the Bible said you're to wash with running water. They didn't wash with running water. They just had bowls of water that the doctors that were caring for the people with the plague dip their hands in water over and over again because they didn't know about germs. But they said, hey, the Torah says to use running water. They started using running water, and then they started actually healing people. Listen, the Bible is not a medical book, but every time it speaks on medical issues, it speaks with 100% accuracy. The Bible is not a history book, but every time it mentions history, it mentions it with 100% accuracy. The Bible is not a, 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 a cosmology book. But every time it mentions space, it mentions it with 100% accuracy, even if it takes centuries for us to figure it out. That's what inspiration looks like. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted, these world rulers. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. And he will also blow on them. Where do we already get the breath of the Lord blowing on something in this chapter? The withering grass and the fading flower, right? It's not just the breath of God that brings us life. It's the breath of God that can cause death. Okay? You got to be pretty powerful for that, right? He will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the world will take them away like stubble. It's talking about governments, world rulers, okay? 1930s, Adolf Hitler claimed what? He was ushering in a 1,000-year reign of Nazism. 1,000-year reign of Nazism in the 30s, okay? It lasted 12 years. The breath of the Lord blew upon it. It was gone. Okay? Now, to whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Listen, you're about to get advice about when you're struggling with your faith. He says this in verse 26. 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. What do you think he's pointing you to there? The stars. Now, we really struggle with seeing stars in South Florida, don't we? Okay? We really struggle with seeing with stars. How many of you have been somewhere with no light pollution and you looked up in the s sky? It's a far different sky, isn't it? It's blanketed with stars. Blanketed with stars. Can you imagine in Isaiah's day, there's no electricity anywhere. The most they can do is light a candle somewhere. Okay, night after night, it says uh, the sky utters forth speech. It was speaking to them of their creator all the time. Okay. And Abraham's told, if you can count the stars, that's how many your offspring shall be. Right. And he would have a strong idea that I'm going to have a countless number of, of offspring of which you in this room are counted amongst them, aren't you? Because we're told by Paul that it's not all Israel that's really Israel, right? So as to have the faith of Abraham, right, that become Israel. So he says, lift up your eyes and high and see who created these things. He's pointing you to the stars. Now, our sun is a star, correct? It's actually in the category of a dwarf star. It's tiny, okay? It's a tiny, tiny star. Even though you could fit hundreds, if not thousands, of Earths inside of that sun. But as a star, it's, it's, it's a dwarf. I don't know if that's politically correct. It's a little person star or something. Okay? Now, <laughs> I got head shakes on that one. But anyways, um, you guys heard of Beetle Geist? Okay? You can fit. I think it's 1.5 million suns across the diameter of Betelgeuse. And you could fit, I forget how many Earths inside the sun, tons of Earths inside the sun. Okay. Sometimes you can see these awesome videos on YouTube where it'll show you the Earth and then it'll bring the sun next to it and you see that we're just a dot in the corner of the sun and then they'll bring other stars by name next to the sun and you see the sun becomes a tiny, tiny dot. And then beetle guys will become a tiny dot. And these stars just get so enormous, it's unimaginable. It's how big these things are out there. Some of them are so dense that if a cubic inch of that star dropped on our earth, it would penetrate all the way through to the other side. Okay. They are spectacular in many different ways. And Genesis records the creation of these magnificent stars by saying this. And he made the stars also. What did you do also today? He made the stars also. Oh, yeah. He made the stars also. Okay. Now, he says, look up in the sky and see who created these things, who brings out their host by number, by number. Now, our telescopes have seen about 100 billion galaxies averaging 10 billion stars. 100 billion galaxies averaging 10 billion stars. That's 100 billion trillion stars that we've seen. Okay. It says he brings them out by number and calls them by their name. Book of Job actually names some of these stars. And now why is the Bible telling you that? It says, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them's missing. Now that's great for the stars, but what's that mean for you? Because what else does he know by name? So 27 says, then why do you say, O Jacob, and why do you speak, O Israel, that your way is hidden from the Lord and your just claim is passed over by your God? Why would you say that? He says, look up in the sky and look at all those stars. I know them all by name. And by the strength of my might, not one of them's missing. So why would you, created in my image that I'm willing to die for, say that your way is hidden from me? That your way is hidden from me. That's why I love the story of Nathaniel in John 1. Okay? As he approaches Jesus for the first time, Jesus claims, there is a true Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel says, how do you know me? 
says, I saw you under the fig tree, which doesn't sound like a big deal, right? But what Nathaniel knows, based on what Jesus is going to tell him about, you'll see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's a Jacob's Ladder reference. And there's other references to Jacob given in that text. So what we can learn from that is he not only knew where Nathaniel was under the fig tree, he knew what he was doing, reading. He knew what he was reading, Genesis 28. He knew what he was thinking about what he was reading. Jacob's a deceiver. I'm not. I'm a true Israelite. No deceit in me. Yet, I'm a nobody under a fig tree. And then when he comes, Jesus says, I know what's going on in your heart. I know what troubles you. I know you're a true Israelite indeed in whom there's no deceit. And I'm actually going to make you an apostle today. Okay? So, he says, how do you think I don't know? How do you think that your way is hidden from me? And your just claim is passed over. Okay? He cares for you. He is not too great to care, yet he is too great to fail. He's not too great to care about you, but he is too great to fail. That's the one that knows you by name. 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? Okay, we need to act like we know this stuff. We've heard this us. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. His ways are higher than our ways, right? He gives power, not to the powerful, right? He gives power to the weak. That's where his attention is. Attention, when it's being used. Okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight when it's being used. Okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight being used. Okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight when it's used. Okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight and support weight. Okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight and support weight. And okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight and support weight and pull things. Okay, when a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight and support weight and pull things. When a rope is strong and it can actually hold weight. And support weight and pull things. Strong and it can actually hold weight and support weight and pull things. Strong and it can actually hold weight and support weight and pull things. And it can actually hold weight and support weight and pull things. Okay? Actually hold weight and support weight and pull things. Okay? Hold weight and support weight and pull things. Okay? So weight. And support weight and pull things. Okay? So those who are useful, being useful for God, their weight on the Lord, will renew their strength. Mount up with wings like eagles. Run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, this chapter started with your grass or your flowers. You're going to wither. You're going to fade. But there's something that abides forever. It's the word of God, right? It stands forever. And then thankfully we get that fulfilled in John 1. He's the word and he wants to abide in us. He wants to make us eternal, right? So the first voice is telling you to prepare for that. Through what? Repentance. Prepare for that through repentance. And you'll become like him and that you'll be eternal. He'll make you like him eternal. How does this chapter end? Well, it says, listen. The, 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 the most energetic of you will get weary. The strongest of you will fall. But not those who wait upon the Lord. Not those who are busy about the Lord's business. They will renew their strength, mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, walk and not be faint. What does it say in verse 28? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. Isn't it inviting you to become like him if you wait on the Lord? You'll neither faint nor be weary. Okay? So this chapter starts with, you're not going to live forever, grass and flower. But you can if you prepare the way of your king 
repent of your sin, you'll be made eternal with him, and in this world you will have trouble, right, Jesus says? And so while you're here being saved, not for your purposes only, but for so many other people's benefit, your salvation and for so many other people's benefit, okay? Your salvation had tons of other people in mind when God saved you, okay? Okay? It's going to be a neat thing to discover when you get to heaven. And so while you're waiting on the Lord in this way, serving him, you're promised new strength, renewed energy, like rising up on wings like eagles. You're going to be like God, and now you won't become weary and you won't faint. Okay, the same way the Lord neither is weary or faints. Okay, so this is our call to not conform to the patterns of the world, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are told that we are predestined for what? Romans 8 says it's to be conformed to the image of his son, right? Who doesn't get weary. He doesn't faint. Okay, He doesn't fall. He doesn't totter. Okay? And you're, this is a call to behold, correct? Call to behold. So let's take the three voices together for a minute. 800 years before Christ, it says you have a king coming. You have to prepare his way through repentance in the wilderness of your heart. He wants to make you eternal with him. He wants you to proclaim with a loud and clear voice and to have you not fear proclaiming and to have no doubts about what you're proclaiming. Okay, he wants you to teach people to behold your God. Okay, that he's bigger and better than your greatest imagination of him. He's better than that. Okay, all your thoughts on heaven. Okay, it's better than that. Paul was shown heaven. And all he could say was surpassing greatness, surpassing greatness. The surpassing graces of knowing Christ your Lord. Okay? It's like these waves of greatness just overflowing each other. Okay? So we behold these things. So your king is coming. Prepare his way through repentance. He wants to make you eternal and cry out to behold. And you will be conformed into his image. You will... Neither weary nor faint, just like the Lord. You'll live forever, just like the Lord. He's conforming you to the image of his son. Isn't that glorious? Okay. That's what Romans 8 says you're predestined towards. Okay. Not, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but you will be conformed into the image of his son. That's his promise. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word and uh, who you are. Lord, and I pray uh, as your word just fed our hearts, Lord, that we would grow from that nourishment, Lord, we would uh, be closer to who you would always have us to be, Lord, unashamed of the gospel of Christ in the church and out of the church, that the world would greatly benefit from your saving act of bringing us from darkness to light, Lord, that many people would benefit from our salvation in ways that matter eternally. So praise you, God, and thank you, God. Be with your people as a warrior and as a shepherd. As we, Lord, ask that you increase our capacities for imagining just how wonderful you really are. And we pray all these things. In the name of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, I think I got kind of an awkward job of uh, Mike is home celebrating his wife's birthday with her. It's a wonderful reason to not be here. Um, he said he would text me the questions that came in. And so me being so prepared for that, I turned my phone off. So as that warms up, I can start with questions from right here in the house, if we have any at all. 
um, in-house questions. Freddie, we got a microphone coming to you. We have one second. Well, they can't they can't hear you on the camera, so they gotta okay. speak into the mic there. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a question, but I do have an observation to tell you about Betelgeuse and Orion. Betelgeuse is actually in the constellation Orion. Is and it? Yes, it is. Which star is it? It's the star. It should be the one on the left. Of the belt. Yep. That's and it's and the size of it is actually that if you put it in the middle of our sun. It it's goes out to the orbit of Jupiter. That's how big it is. So if you placed it where the sun is, it would extend all the way out to Jupiter. Orbit. The whole orbit of Jupiter. Uh, the whole orbit of Jupiter. Yes. That's massive. That's massive. Yeah. Something to behold. <laughs> massive, yes. Wow. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's see what we got here. Nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, we got one back there, and then we'll take one up here. Go ahead. <coughs> just a just a little question, and um, I, I know how you mentioned um, some of the medical terms that the Bible has, has talked about was completely accurate. Do you know of any studies or anything that they've done on a mustard seed? When Jesus said, "Look at the mustard uh, seed," well, look look at the mustard. Uh, there's no greater herb. Uh, just that. Um, you know, the mustard seed is a pod of smaller seeds that are within it. So I've heard the criticism of Jesus doesn't know his own agriculture because the mustard seed's not the smallest of seeds. But I think the seed that people are criticizing is, is an actual pod of made up of other seeds that are inside that pod. And I think those qualify as the smallest of seeds that Jesus is referring to. Is that what you're asking about? Oh. Yeah, anything else you have to add to that is going to be new to me. That's I just gave you my entire knowledge of the mustard seed. Yes. Um, the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles. Yes. So you've mentioned in previous um, classes that whenever Jesus Christ is cited or was cited in the Old Testament, you call these Christophanies. Um, in First Chronicles uh, chapter 21, when the enemy incited David to go and take census of the fighting men of uh, Jerusalem, um, that angel of the Lord that came to put the plague on David, was that Jesus Christ or was that Michael or Gabriel? Yeah. Um She's referred to when David took the census of Israel and the Lord gave him three options as a consequence. And um, he chose the option that actually the Lord seemed to have the most control over. It wasn't, it wasn't the war th that he could have been under running from his enemies. Uh, he chose the one that was strictly in the Lord's hand. That was a three-day plague. That's what you're referring to? Yeah. And so she's asking, uh, as we discuss Christophanies, which normally the Christophany is identified as the angel of the Lord in the Bible, um, is that angel that in inflicted that plague a Christophany. Um, it doesn't have any of the identifying features that I see in Christophanies, so um, I've never seen it as one. Um, to me, it, it, would, it sounds more like the Passover angel, you know, um, but... Um, I couldn't tell you I'm certain on that, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, wh what I do is this. So I would look at that angel in First Chronicles and say, is there anything that is true of um, the purpose of him coming into the world was to announcement. Um, the purpose of him coming into the world was to avenge Israel. Um, the purpose of him coming into the world was to avenge Israel of the Philistines. 
So anything that results in Philistine deaths is actually fulfillment of his ministry. And Samson is celebrated in his death narrative with the words that he killed more Philistines in his death than he did throughout his life. That's actually saying he fulfilled more of his ministry in his death than he did in his life, which makes him a type of Christ. Christ fulfilled more of his ministry in his death than he did in his life. And it actually gives you, you know, Samson, his name means sun, like the sun in the sky, S-U-N. Samson means sun. And, um, and, and what do they do to him? They gouge out his eyes, right? So you have the sun going dark. Okay, just like at the cross, and the sun went dark, right? And then it says he put his, very descriptively, he puts his hand on this pillar, and he puts his hand on this pillar. So the sun's gone dark, and you have the hero of the story in this posture about to die. Does it look familiar at all? Okay. And then he, he pushes down the pillars, and uh, the roof comes down, and, and he kills the 3,000 that are on the roof. It actually gives you the number 3,000. It says he killed more Philistines in his death than in his life. And then, and then, and then, um, so the, so he becomes um, a type of Christ, but he's a prophet of death, just like Moses was a prophet of death. You know, Moses, uh, the ten plagues, and his very first miracle was turning water to blood. We see water symbolizing life and blood, death. So he changes life into death. You know, uh, and you see that through the Egyptians, and then Jesus almost imitates that first miracle. Moses' first miracle was water to blood. What was Jesus's? Water to, wine. water to wine. And wine represents joy. So Jesus says, I come to give you life, that's the water, and to give it to you to the full, that's the wine. And so um, so you see that he's showing that he's a greater prophet than Moses. Well, he's also a greater prophet than Samson. He's a greater judge than Samson. Remember, what did Samson do to show Israel that he was their judge? He was their leader. He was in charge. He took the city gates off the hinges and put them on his shoulders and went up on a hill to show Israel city gates where they did business, did government, put them on his shoulders and to show Israel the government's on my shoulders. Now, what's Isaiah's prophecy of the virgin born baby one day? The government will be on his shoulders. So from from that audience's perspective, they're able to say the one that Isaiah said would be born of a virgin in the future one day is going to be the same one that um, is going to be a greater judge than Samson that had the government on his shoulders. Samson's life obviously ended, uh, his ministry ended poorly, but uh, Jesus's will be fulfilled in, in his death and so forth. So, um, you know, those prophecies of his birth in Isaiah, I think we went over this in the Emmanuel songs, I believe. I should have anyways. And it talks about he'll be called Wonderful, you know, that had a Samson reference. I believe I pointed to that. The government will be on his shoulders is another Samson reference. Says there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. That was a David reference. It even mentions David in the next verse because David had a dramatic end to his government and peace through the sin of Bathsheba. Okay, Israel was on top of the world when he met Bathsheba. And then through that sin, the consequence of that sin, Israel started in rapid decline to this very day. They haven't rebounded from David's sin with Bathsheba. So, um, so I think there's got to be some, so all those connections I just drew, I think frees us to say that Jesus was in that story because everything's pointing to Jesus there. I'd have to look at that plague a little closer. Um, I haven't looked at it with an eye for it being a Christophany, but I'll do that and see what it looks like. Okay, sure, yep. Is that it? Going once, going twice. And I have not heard from Mike. Not a single question tonight, he said. Okay, all right. You guys have a wonderful Wednesday night, and uh, we shall see you next week. I believe we have two more Wednesdays, so we'll do those uh, incredible servant songs. Amazing text in the servant songs next week. And then um, I'm going to walk you through my all-time favorite teaching of the fulfillment of the tabernacle in Jesus' ministry. Uh, and we'll close out the class with that two weeks from tonight. All right. I believe we prayed. So have a wonderful night. And see you next week.